Good afternoon and welcome to the 2023 Annual Florey Public Lecture. My name is Josie Gray, the Development Manager within the Advancement Branch at the University of Adelaide. I would like to acknowledge this land that we meet today, which is the traditional land for Ghana people, and that we respect their spiritual relationships with their country. Before we officially begin this sold out event, a few housekeeping rules. First of all, please turn off your phone or put it on silent. Toilets are located on the ground floor, exiting to your right outside of the lecture theatre around past the cafe. In the case of emergency, please follow the instructions of our identified staff members. At the conclusion of tonight's lecture, please join us for some light refreshments that will be available in the foyer. As mentioned, this public lecture is a sold out event and is being live streamed to many who have registered online. It is also being recorded and available for any interested parties. Now it is my sincere pleasure to introduce Professor Andrew Zanatino, who will officially introduce tonight's speaker. Professor Andrew Zanatino is the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences at the University of Adelaide. He is also a Professor of Experimental Haematology and co-directs the Myeloma Research Laboratory within the Precision Cancer Medicine theme at the South Australian Health Medical Research Institute, SAMRI. The laboratory focuses on identifying the molecular and cellular mechanisms of myeloma disease progression and myeloma-associated bone loss. In addition to his research into multiple myeloma, Andrew is a recognised leader in the field of mesenchymal stem cell biology, and his work in this area underpins the world's largest cell therapy company, Mesoblast Limited. In addition to these important scientific and leadership roles, Andrew is a founding member of the Medical and Scientific Advisory Group of Myeloma Australia. He also serves on the Executive Management Group for the Cancer Council, and is a non-executive director of Oz Health Proprietary Limited. Please join me in welcoming Professor Andrew Zanatino to the podium. She knows I have a very loud voice, that's why she took the microphone away. Look, thank you, um, and uh, thank you so much, Josie. Uh, before um, I introduce our speaker this evening, I also would like to acknowledge that we meet on the land of the Ghana people. Um, I have a, a little um, thing that I've been doing since I've been in the role of Executive Dean, and, and that is to, to actually welcome or uh, acknowledge country in Ghana. And so I apologise to anyone who is Ghana in the audience, because uh, my pronunciation could be rather poor. But Mani Nadlu Tampinthi, Nadlu, Ghana Yatanga Imparenthi. So that's really just to acknowledge that we are meeting on the land of the Ghana people and acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. Um, it is really my absolute pleasure to introduce our 2023 Flory Public Lecture um, speaker this evening. It, the, the, this Flory Lecture series is, is a highlight for our faculty and acknowledges the, the amazing work that, has been, uh, that was performed uh, by Lord Baron um, and, and um, Flory, who, uh, many, many moons ago, and his work has saved upwards of 20 to 30 million people. Um, the, as mentioned by Josie, the interest in this lecture has been rather overwhelming. We had 600 people registered for this event, um, and it's, uh, as she mentioned, it's sold out. We have, as she said, also organised a live stream, and it will be recorded for perpetuity, and people can actually share it with their friends as well. Um, as many of you would know, and who have been to Flory Lectures in previous years, we've actually decided to hold it a little later. And that's really largely down to the fact that I was really keen for you to all meet Professor Luigi Fontana, our guest speaker this evening. Um, I think it goes without saying that him coming down to Adelaide to present this lecture is a, a real delight for me. Um, Lou is an incredible presenter, as you'll soon note. Um, and he comes to us from Sydney uh, and is the Leonard P. Ullman Chair in Translational Metabolic Health at the Charles Perkins Centre, where he directs the Charles Perkins Centre Royal Prince Alfred Clinic and Healthy Longevity Research and Clinical Program. Uh, professor Fontana is also a Professor of Medicine and Nutrition in the Faculty of Medicine 
and Health at the University of Sydney, a clinical academic in the Department of Endocrinology at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney as well. Before arriving in Sydney, Professor Fontana was the Professor of Medicine and co-director of the Healthy Longevity Program at the Washington University School of Medicine. So this is going to go on for a while, folks, so just settle in. Uh, there's a lot to be said about this amazing man. Uh, Professor Fontana received his medical training at the University of Verona in Italy and graduated with honours in 1994. After two years as an intern and resident at the University of Verona Medical School, Professor Fontana joined the Laboratory of Clinical Pharmacology at King's College School of Medicine at the University of London. Returning to the University of Verona in 1998 to become Chief Medical Resident in Internal and Emergency Medicine. In 2004, he completed his PhD in Metabolism at the University of Padova School of Medicine in Italy. Um, he is an internationally recognised physician scientist and one of the world's leaders in the field of nutrition and healthy longevity in humans. His pioneering clinical studies on the effects of dietary restriction have opened a new era of nutrition-related research that holds tremendous promise for the prevention of age-associated chronic disease. His research has delivered a paradigm shift in our understanding of how dietary restriction deeply influences human ageing um, and the initiation, progression and prognosis of many, many clinical conditions ranging from obesity to type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease and cancer. It's truly the time to come for, it's really a time for us to change our conversation about chronic disease and to repurpose and refresh our model of healthcare delivery. Um, and this is really empowering the notion of prevention uh, and using best evidence to change health outcomes for our community. I would like now for you to join me in welcoming Louis, Professor Luigi Fontana, or Lou to his friends, with his presentation titled Changing the Conversation from Chronic Disease to Chronic Health. Thank you. Hello, thank you, Andrew, for, the, for your kind words and for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here in uh, Adelaide. <clears throat> so today we're going to try to discuss about health and well-being and, and longevity. Of course, you know, in, in 15 minutes it's going to be difficult, you know, to be exhausted. But you know, I'll try to to give you some some concept. So first of all, let's let's start with a, with a, with a, with a short survey. So. What, what do you think is an ideal age, you know, to, to die? So in this room, how many people of you think, you know, 80 years is enough? You know, because sometimes people say, oh, no, look, you know, I don't want to live a long life. For me, 80 is more than enough. How many people in this room say, you know, I'm fine with 80? One, two, three, four. It's all people. <laughs> how many people, they would like to live 120 years? How many people forever? Because, <laughs> you know, there are, you know, these people like, you know, the, 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 the Aubrey de Grey, you know, they are talking about negligible senescence, you know, the idea, you know, that in, a, in, the, in the near future we're going to, you know, engineer humans, you know, to, to, to age very, very slowly, so negligible. But, so basically we have probably 50% say, you know, 80 years is, is, is more than enough, and some people say, say, you know, no, I would like to live longer. But what about if I will say, you know, you can live 120 years with the same age of a 50, 60 years old? How many of you will say yes? Yeah, most of you, isn't it? Okay. And so that's the concept between lifespan and health span because, you know, to be honest, you know, in the last 150 years, we double lifespan, you know, from 45 years in 1850 to 80 years for men and 84 for women in developed countries. So it's almost doubling of lifespan. But the quality of these years is not, the last, you know, the last 10, 15, 20 years is not as great. So, and we'll discuss about the consequences later. So, from a biological point of view, we know, you know that you know, we can live a long and healthy life. Indeed, centenarians, 20% of centenarians, they don't develop any disease 
before the age of 100. So from a, from a biological point of view, we know that it's possible, not only in rodents, but in humans. Okay? Uh, some people say, okay, but this is due to genes. So what do you think is the percentage of longevity due to genes and to environmental factors? Is 20, 50, 80% due to gene and how much? So try. 50%, how many of you say it's 50%? 50% genes, 50%? 75% due to genes? and 25% to the environment? 20. 20. 20 in the other way. So 20 genes and 80% and environmental factors. OK. So based on studies on identical twins, so these twins, they have the same genetics, the same DNA because identical twins, basically probably 25% approximately is due to in the genes, 75% is due to environmental factors, okay? And there are new studies published in genetics in, on a, basically, these are ancestry public trees of, of over hundreds of millions of people, probably it's less than 10%. So let's say, you know, basically between 10 and 25% is due to inherited genes, the rest is due to environmental factors. That's good news. It means, you know, basically, you know, we can take control of our health and longevity. Of course, there are many, many factors. You know, there are some that, you know, we have been studying for years that are very important, like diet and exercise, but, but, but it's a, a, a number of factors that are basically predicting our health and longevity, including socioeconomic factors that are very important. You know, for example, in Sydney, uh, there is a 25, 26 year difference in lifespan uh, you know, between, you know, different uh, socioeconomic areas of Sydney. And, of course, the environment. Because even if you are the healthiest people on this planet, but you live in a highly polluted place, it's going to be difficult. You're going to live a long and healthy life. Okay? And so we have to protect the environment. It is a must uh, in, the, in the coming years. And we start to see, you know, some of the signs of the environmental. Now, aging... What we discovered is aging is not like, like a wear and tear process, but it's highly regulated. There are a number of genes and molecular pathways that we have been dissecting that are very important in regulating the accumulation of damage as we age. <clears throat> Until probably the beginning of the century, it was a, like a black box. We didn't know why we were aging and what were the mechanisms. And then in 1935, this professor, McKay, just by chance, you know, he did an experiment. He wanted to study something else, but, you know, basically these rats were put on 30% calorie restriction, so they, he feed them 30% less than what they were, would eat at libitum. And what he found is that basically these animals were living 50% longer. Amazing, okay? Just by chance. It was not the, the, the goal of his research. And then after that, you know, hundreds of scientists and thousands of papers have been published showing that in all the organisms, the, the simple and, uh, organisms and, and, and uh, uh, mice and rats, basically, dietary restriction without malnutrition extend lifespan and health span, uh, in, in, again, in multiple organisms. When I started to work on calorie restriction in 2001, there were no data in humans, in, 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 in humans and in monkeys, but, you know, they were starting to develop data in, in, in monkeys. And these are the results of uh, the Wisconsin primate color restriction study. So uh, this monkey, they were 30% color restricted. They eat 30% less without malnutrition. So color restriction with all the vitamins and, and minerals <coughs> compared to the libidum fed. So there was basically an extension in lifespan, in health span, Complete prevention of type 2 diabetes, 50% less cancer, 50% less cardiovascular disease, less brain atrophy by functional MRI, less sarcopenia, and less frailty. These are all scientific papers published in, in top-tier journals. 
Then there is another, another study, is the NIA, the National Institute of Aging study of 30% calorie restriction in monkeys. It's a long story because, you know, when I started to work on calorie restriction, the dogma was that only calories were important. Now we know, you know, the composition of the diet is equally important, and we are dissecting, you know, these, these mechanisms. However, to make a long story short, you know, in this study, 30% of the monkeys they lived more than 40, on CR, they lived more than 40 years. 40 years for a monkey is like probably 120 years from, from human beings because on average monkeys, resource monkeys live 26 years, so 40 years is a very long life. And uh, Sherman, the oldest on set CR male, died when she, he was 44 years old. That is probably equivalent to 135 years. So these are the longest lived monkeys on Earth, okay, that never lived in captivity on, on, on Earth. Suggesting, also based on some DNA methylation clock measurements, you know, that you know, in, in primates, in non-human primates, you know, color restriction is extending health and lifespan. Now, I don't have time in this, in this, in this lecture you know, to explain all the studies on humans, but for many years when I was working at Washington University, we did a lot of studies, cross-sectional and randomized clinical trial, to understand if humans adapt to calorie restriction as long-lived animals do, and the answer is yes. You know, with few exceptions, humans have the same metabolic, molecular, physiological adaptations that long-lived mice and, and rats. And you know, we published this, this paper in, 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 in this data in several uh, high impact factor journals. Now, to make, because this is a public lecture, it's not for scientists specialized in this field, you know, I'm going to try, you know, to give you some ideas of what you can do, you know, to improve your health uh, based on uh, data. So I'm going to use the, the new uh, uh, American Heart Association dietary guidelines. So that's been published in 2021. So these are the guidelines by the American Heart Association, that's the leading cardiological association in the world. So these are the 10 points. We're going to go through uh, most of them very quickly. So number one of these guidelines is adjust energy intake uh, uh, to achieve uh, an expenditure to achieve a healthy body weight. I slightly disagree. I don't like, you know, body weight. I think, you know, that, you know, a better definition should be take action to reduce your waistline because the real bad fat is the abdominal fat. So what you want to do is to try to avoid, you know, to increase your waistline, or if you have an increase in waistline, you want to try to reduce the, 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 the waistline as much as you can while preserving skeletal muscle mass because especially the big, the big muscle of the, of the femoral gluteal regions are very important for the prevention of diabetes, inflammation, and many other metabolic complications. Of course, also sarcopenia and frailty is a major problem in our Western societies. Now, can, it can be achieved, and the answer is yes. For example, this is a, these are the results of a randomized clinical trial we did when I was at WashU. We, we recruited men and women 50 to 60 years old, BMI 25 to 30, so overweight, and we randomized them for a year to control or X means exercise, so there was a 20% increase in energy expenditure by endurance exercise without calorie restriction, or calorie restriction, 20% reduction in calorie intake without exercise. Uh, we achieved over a year 8% weight loss. And by the way, if you go on Google and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you write uh, exercise and weight loss, you're gonna find you know, exercise it's good to maintain body weight, but doesn't induce weight loss. This study shows that, you know, instead of that's not true, but to achieve an 8% weight loss with exercise, oop, you need, in this study, people exercise one hour a day, six days a week, at 72% of max heart rate. Max heart rate is 220 minus your age, then you calculate, set, between, I would say, 60 and 80 percent of your max heart rate, if you exercise for an hour, six days a week, you can achieve an 8 percent weight loss. And by MRI, we achieve a 40 percent reduction in visceral fat, okay, the bad fat, with one year of exercise only. 
And this superachiever guy who lost 14% of his body weight had a 74% reduction in visceral fat in one year. So this is super, super powerful. You know, there is a super powerful medication. Diet and exercise are medicine. Not only that, you know, in this study we show, you know, both exercise and calorie restriction, they were uh, improving glucose and glucose tolerance, insulin sensitivity, so they were reducing insulin levels uh, in, in a very substantial way. And, uh, and why is important? Because what we are finding is that, as I was telling you, these aging pathways, we are finding by studying uh, animal models of longevity, you know, that one of the key anti-aging pathway is the insulin IGF-1 and TOR pathway, okay? So whenever, you know, we reduce insulin because we, we become, so what happens, you know, that, you know, when you have excess abdominal fat, this fat is producing hormones called adipokines that are causing peripher peripheral insulin resistance. And when you have peripheral insulin resistance, the beta cells of the pancreas, they are over-secreting insulin to try to, over, to compensate for this insulin resistance. And therefore, you know, your cells are basically constantly bathed in these high insulin levels, also because a lot of people, they are eating all day long. And so, you know, you have the postprandial increase in glucose and the postprandial increase in insulin that is always high, high, high for 8 a.m. until probably 10, 11 p.m. because people, they constantly eat and they have constantly exposure to high insulin. That is a pro-aging, pro-cancer factor. There is no doubt, you know, that this, this is a major driver of aging. And the reason is that basically what we are finding, you know, because, you know, with this beautiful science and molecular biology, we are also finding why a overexposure of cells to insulin IGF-1, they are promoting aging and cancer because when you have uh, low insulin, low IGF-1, because you have low adiposit and you exercise, you have an increase in FOXO, that is a transcriptional factor, that is increasing autophagy, so the capacity of your cell to clean cells because this autophagy process is, is basically digesting misfolded proteins and dysfunctional organelles, so getting rid of garbage within your cells, is increasing DNA repair genes, so better capacity to repair DNA, is increasing antioxidant pathways like SO2 and catalases, as is inhibiting big ways the cell cycle, so, so cell proliferations. Less cell proliferation, less random mutation, less cancer, less cell senescence. In the same study, we also show, you know, these both exercise and calorie restriction, they were reducing LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, increasing the good cholesterol, especially exercise, we knew about that, but it's confirming it, and reducing inflammation, C-reactive protein. So it has multiple beneficial effects, uh, and in other studies, uh, with calorie restriction, we found a major reduction in inflammation, c protein, TNF-alpha, and uh, a reduction in oxidative stress measured with uh, urinary F2 isoprostate, that is the gold standard to measure oxidative stress. So to make a long story short, you know, this is a super powerful, these both exercise and, and, and calorie restriction, they are super powerful in changing multiple metabolic and molecular risk factors. Indeed, you know, other studies that we did, you know, by taking biopsy in the skeletal muscle of these people or colon mucosa biopsies are showing that, yes, there is an increase in autophagy genes and proteins, there is an increase in DNA repair uh, genes, there is an increase in chaperones called ICSI proteins are very important to keep, you know, the proteins healthy and young and a major reduction in inflammation. So even at molecular level, there is an effect on multiple molecular factors that are in line with what we are uh, understanding about aging. Now, you maybe ask, but how can I do calorie restriction? What does it mean, calorie restriction? In animals, it's very easy. You, know, you, you measure how much an animal is eating, and then you reduce by 30 40% the amount. Okay? But in humans, it's going to be difficult you know, to weigh the food and calculate you know, what you are eating. So here are some tricks that you know, I think you, know, you can use. One is this concept of hurry. Harahachibumi is a, kind, is, a, is a Japanese saying that, you know, stop eating when you are 80% full. Instead of in our society, especially in the U.S., you know, you have this huge, large plate of food, and people, they keep eating until they are almost suffocating, you know, because they want to clean the plate. So 
eat a small portion, and then you know, stop when you are 80% full. Another one could be intermittent fasting. So eating basically, so fasting uh, two, three times a week, depending on your, your goals, your aims. So in this study uh, that I did when I was at Washington University, this randomized clinical trial, we randomized people for six months plus six months of partial crossover to a two or three days of vegetable fasting. So we allowed people to eat non-starchy raw or cooked vegetables, uh, dressed with two tablespoons of olive oil and vinegar or lemon or spices, uh, and, uh, 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 and, and basically, we achieved in six months 8% weight loss because in this way, on a weekly basis, it was a 23% calorie restriction and a 16% reduction in body fat measured by DEXA. This is the gold standard to measure body fat. So in terms of redu reducing body weight and body fat, it works. But when we measured, the primary outcome was C-reactive protein, no change in C-reactive protein, no change in TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, and many other ones, and, and very tiny change in glucose tolerance and insulin sensitivity. These data, along with many other studies you know, that people are conducting, are suggesting that the composition of the diet during the non-fasting days is influencing the metabolic response to weight loss. Because in this study, people, they were consuming a typical American diet, and then they were fasting two or three days a week, and they said, you know, okay, fasting is going to delay aging and promote health. And so what we are finding is, no, what you are eating during the non-fasting days is influencing the metabolic response. So you are losing weight, body fat, but metabolically, you have very little benefits. And, uh, and, and another important point is that Fasting in humans is not like fasting in animals because, you know, we have a lot of data showing that intermittent fasting in mice is extending lifespan, but two days of fasting in a mice is deadly. After two days, they die of starvation. I can go for a month without eating. There are people, this, this person who was uh, 207 kilos, he fasted for 382 days, water only plus vitamins and minerals, okay? So... How, how long you can fast is depends how, how much fat you have, okay? But again, two days of fasting in a mice is probably like, uh, uh, one day of fasting in a mice is probably like five days of fasting in a human being. So probably what we have been studying so far with intermittent fasting in mice is five days of fasting, five days of eating. Five days of fasting, five days of eating. And five days of fasting is markedly reducing IGF-1. Is that of in humans, calorie restriction is not reducing IGF-1. So there are some caveats that, you know, that, you know, that are not so simple. So when you hear about, you know, intermittent fasting extending longevity is not true. And another rule could be time sensitive feeding. Here we have Leone, who is a, uh, an expert in working at the University of Adelaide about this topic. And she just published a nature medicine paper, very, very interesting. Uh, and so intermittent fasting, again, in rodents is reducing the deposit inflammation, improving insulin sensitivity. But again, I think, you know, the times of the feeding, 12 hours of restricting feeding in mice is not like 12 hours of restricting feeding in humans because of what I told you before of the high metabolism. Indeed, a paper published in New Israel of Medicine that is one of the most important medical journals shows that, you know, basically, if you do calorie restriction alone or calorie restriction plus times of the feeding, so the people that were eating all these calories in 10 hours, there is no difference in weight and many metabolic. We can argue, you know, the study was not perfect. Still, the data on the independent effects of time sensitive feeding, independent of quality, they are not, you know, clear. And I, I, we need more studies because even in, in, in Leone's study, the, the, the time sensitive feeding did didn't reduce triglyceride, and we know calorie restriction as a, no, calorie restriction didn't reduce significantly triglyceride, and we know triglyceride are, are highly reduced by calorie restriction. So we need more studies to understand. And finally, probably the most powerful intervention of all is eating a typical Mediterranean kind of Okinawa diet, a high fiber diet, like a pesco vegetarian diet, with lots of fiber. In this study, you know, we did a Wash U, uh, we are still working on the data. Basically, 
we, uh, I randomize people to a Mediterranean diet, lots of vegetables, whole grains and beans and fish, no processed food, um, and no, uh, no red meat. And in this study, I asked my dietitian to clamp the body weight so because I wanted to study the effects of changing quality without weight loss. What we found that you know, we had to overfeed people to 150 calories because just on the high fiber diet, Mediterranean-like diet, people, they were losing weight very rapidly. So if you just improve your diet and you go from a typical American diet to a real traditional Mediterranean Okinawan diet, you're going to lose weight. OK, so let's move you know, to the number two and three of the guidelines. Number two, eat plenty of fruits and vegetables, choose a wide variety. The number three of the guidelines is choose foods made mostly with whole grains rather than refined grains. So there is now all this, you know, fed about carbs being bad, you know, the ketogenic diet, the high protein diet. But the problem, you know, you know when people they are talking about carbohydrates, they are talking about refined carbohydrates. Last night I went to, for dinner, this morning breakfast. All the carbohydrates that, you know, that are serving in, in, in the restaurants is highly refined, highly processed, has nothing to do with the real uh, high, uh, high uh, fiber uh, complex carbohydrates that we know are healthy. You know, these are studies publishing, that we publish in science and showing that, you know, that for example, the, uh, uh, the composition of the gut microbiota, uh, uh, of our gut microbiota depends two of the most important nutrients are fiber and protein that are shaping our gut microbiota and the production of metabolites. And just to give an example, so normally we eat, you know, in the grain, you know, we eat the starch and we remove the germ that is rich in a lot of essential uh, nutrients and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, how do you say, the, the brain, the brain, okay, that is full of other important uh, uh, nutrients. And um, look, you know, for example, whole wheat and refined wheat. Fiber, 11.5%, 1.9%. Uh, basically, zinc, 29.8%. Iron, 35.13%. Selenium, 0.06, 0 0.02%. 0 B6, vitamin B6, 7.5, 1.4%. Ferulic acid, 5.04. So basically, we are eating basically food that is mostly devoted by fiber and vitamins, phytochemicals, minerals, antioxidants, selenium, just because we are eating right now all this refined processed food. And just, you know, I could talk for an hour, but, you know, just to give a, a, a major uh, idea why we need to eat uh, uh, whole grains and, 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 and vegetables and, and legumes that are rich in fiber because this fiber, they get digested by the gut microbiota to produce metabolite called short-chain short fatty acids like propionate butyrate that are binding to G-couple receptor that are very important to reduce inflammation and to shape the uh, immune function of the gut. And what we are finding that probably the uh, epidemic of... Uh, autoimmune disease, allergic diseases that, you know, we see in our societies are probably in part mediated by the low fiber diet that basically is uh, reducing through the gut microbiota the production of these important metabolites that are essential for the prevention of inflammatory disease and autoimmune and allergic diseases. So even if you lose weight on this new drug, the GLP-1 rece uh, uh, receptor agonist, and you have a low fiber diet, rich in salt, in, in, uh, in uh, uh, processed refined food and uh, refined oils and uh, trans fatty acids, you're not going to get healthier. You're going to lose weight like in the other study, but it's, it's not the solution. Now, number four of the guidelines. This is amazing. For the first time when I saw these guidelines, I'm amazing. So choose healthy source of proteins, mostly protein from plants. Then fish and seafood, low fat or fat free dairy instead of full fat dairy products. And for the first time, they claim if meat or poultry are desired, if not, you should eat. If, choose lean cuts and avoid processed foods. 
and whole grains and legumes. You, I keep hearing you know, you know, that only animal products have all the, all the good proteins. Whole grains, a combination of whole grains and legumes contain all the essential amino acids that you need for your health. Okay? Plus, they provide a lot of other phytochemicals, fiber, selenium, and, uh, and minerals, and plant sterols that are reducing your LDL cholesterol, your bad cholesterol is one of the major risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And um, the number five of the guide, the, the, the point number five of the guidelines is basically the type of oil that you know you are consuming. So basically, uh, they suggest to eat liquid plant oils rather than tropical oils like coconut and palm, that, because they are very rich in saturated fatty acids, they are increasing cholesterol, and, uh, uh, and animal fats, butter and lard, they are again very rich in saturated fatty acids, and trans fatty acids are very bad because they increase LDL cholesterol, inflammation, and uh, endothelial dysfunction. Probably the best oil, the best oil, the best uh, uh, condiment is basically press called extra virgin olive oil because not only is very rich in monounsaturated fatty acids, but is also uh, uh, rich in uh, a lot of uh, phytochemicals like uh, uh, tyrosol and hydroxytyrosol that have antioxidant, vitamin E that is antioxidant, and other compounds, including olecanthal, that in this nature paper has been shown to have anti uh, uh, platelet activity. So olecanthal has the same composition of ibuprofen that you know you are taking for uh, uh, anti-inflammatory is you, you don't have enough quantity to cause anti-inflammation but it, like baby aspirin it has an effect in, in, uh, in basically uh, avoiding uh, platelet aggregation. In contrast again uh, our western diet is very rich in animal products uh, especially uh, uh, processed meat that you know the, the World Health Organization uh, claims is a group one carcinogen, uh, and uh, red meat also has been classified as a group two carcinogen. They suggest you know you shouldn't consume more than 300 grams per week of red meat. A lot of sort of a lot of people you know they start breakfast with bacon, and and then sa sandwiches uh, for lunch is uh, uh, turkey and uh, or, or or ham, and and for dinner maybe it's again meat, pork, or you know, so it's too much red meat, too much uh, animal products. And uh, again, red meat uh, and, and dairy is rich in saturated fatty acids that are re linearly correlated with the increase in LDL cholesterol. There are so many studies showing you know, there is a linear correlation between saturated fatty acids and LDL cholesterol. And there are studies, again, showing that, for example, an increased consumption of uh, uh, animal products that are rich in carnitine and choline, they get metabolized by the gut microbiota to produce a metabolite called TMO that has been shown published in New England to increase the risk of myocardial infarction and stroke, basically independently of the classical metabo metabolic risk factor because it's, in co it's causing platelet ag aggregation and endothelial dysfunction. And, uh, and finally, there are mounting evidence uh, that you know, we summarize in this review article that I wrote for Nature Review Molecular Cell Biology, showing that you know, these uh, uh, brain chain amino acids and sulfur amino acids that are very rich in animal products, they promote aging independently of calorie by acting on specific pathways like the mTOR, AT4, FGF21. So there are a number of pathways, pro aging pathways, that are triggered by an excessive intake of brain chain amino acids and sulfur amino acids. So there are a number of factors why you, sh you shouldn't become vegetarian, but uh, it's important you know, to, 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 to uh, um, minimize the consumption of animal products, especially meat. Uh, and to make a long story short, you know, the numbers six, seven, and eight are all suggesting that you should stay away from refined and processed food. Because refined and processed food is rich in uh, uh, high, high, high fructose uh, corn syrup, uh, sugary, uh, simple sugars, uh, salt, S hidden salt is everywhere, and uh, uh, refined oils, trans fatty acids, 
all these are very bad for health, and they are responsible for the epidemic of obesity, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes. There are so many studies supporting that. Uh, the number nine of the guidelines, point of the guidelines is, if you do not drink alcohol, do not start. <laughs> and if you choose to drink alcohol, limit intake to this, you know, there is this rule, two glasses per man, one for women. But in reality, apart from one glass of wine is 226 calories of empty calories, and one craft beer is basically 250 ml, is probably 200 calories. So if you drink, you know, four beers, it's basically 800 calories without doing anything. <clears throat> there are lots of data now supporting the idea that ethanol get metabolized in acetaldehyde that is a pro-cancer substance. And there is no low li low, lower limit. So basically, if you're drinking alcohol, like smoking, you have a small, but you know, accumulating risk of developing uh, cancer and uh, other chronic diseases. However, this is a, re a review article we just published in the European Heart Journal. Because, you know, there is all this idea about, you know, I'm a vegan, I'm a vegetarian, I'm a paleo, I'm a high protein, you know, ev everybody has his own, you know, favorite diet, you know, fat diet. But it doesn't work like that, you know, we have, you know, we are dissecting the mechanisms through which, you know, diet is influencing health and being like, you know, uh, part of this, you know, I'm a vegan. So in this study, basically, you know, what we are saying is that there is overwhelming evidence that, you know, you can be a vegan and have a higher mortality than someone who is omnivore by eating a healthy diet. So there are studies showing a 20% increase in mortality in vegetarians that are eating refined processed food, you know, refined, but you know, all these uh, vegan lasagna, vegan pizza, a lot of sweets, a lot of refined oils, you know, and you can be super unhealthy by being a vegetarian. So being vegetarian or paleo doesn't mean anything. You know, we need to follow science and, and to prescribe diets based on, on uh, science and not about, you know, trends and fed and uh, beliefs. Uh, and uh, I don't have time, you know, to go uh, into other important aspects that are totally misstudied or, or understudied in, 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 in our medical science because apart from what I told you about exercise, quality of diet, diet restriction, uh, there are mounting evidence, you know, cognitive training, sleep is very important for health. You know, there are studies published in science showing that, you know, if you have uh, sleep deprivation or sleep fragmentation, you are depositing beta amyloid and tau in your brain because during sleep, deep sleep, basically the brain is washing and is removing garbage and if you don't sleep enough, basically. And as you know, there is a, a major crisis of sleep deprivation, especially in children. You know, they're spending long hours in front of iPads, you know, until late at night, you know, with blue light. And this is basically disrupting the circadian rhythms with huge consequences on obesity, diabetes, and dementia. But then, you know, there is another port, important part of science, you know, that, you know, we, 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 do not, we don't have enough uh, attention that is, for example, the role of uh, meditation, stress reduction. You know, stress is a major part of our, of our modern lifestyle, uh, anxiety and uh, uh, social emotional learning, social connection, uh, the role of art and philosophy, education, or for... Uh, emotional well-being and uh, uh, the, you know, the altrum is the compassion, the spiritual exercise that make, you know, the life of a human being what it should really be. You know, we are not just, you know, uh, bodies, you know, walking, you know, but, but we are persons that we should develop our best, uh, best uh, inner being and, um, and, and uh, we are not spending enough uh, time and resources, you know, to develop this holistic approach that I think is extremely important. You know, uh, I think, you know, data suggests, you know, 50% of people in Australia, they are developing some psychological uh, conditions during a lifetime. So it's a, it, mental health is a big problem in, in this country and many other 
countries in, develop, in developing, including US, where you, you know, there is this crisis of opioid that is becoming pandemic. Okay, now, conclusions. So, as you know, basically, we, as we discussed, you know, we are, we are experiencing an epidemic of aging. So people all over the places are getting, the society are getting older. And, uh, and um, for example, in my country, Italy, we're already 24% of Italian older than 65, predicted 34% in 2050. In 2050, one third of Italian is gonna be older than 65. And we published data in Italy showing that of these people older than 65, at least 65% they have two or more chronic diseases. So basically this is an epidemic of unhealthy aging. These are the new uh, uh, guidelines, uh, well, the new, the 2033 Treasury's Intergenerational Report of Australia. As you can see here, the cost of uh, healthcare, real Australian government health spending per person is now $3,000 per person, predicted $9,000 in uh, uh, 2062. It's gonna triple. And most of the cost is gonna be for hospital expenditure, okay? is unsustainable. There is no country that can sustain you know, this uh, epidemic of unhealthy aging. As I said, you know, aging is one problem, but another major problem in Western society, including Australia, so these are data uh, from the government, 67% of adults uh, are overweight or obese, and 60% 60 60 of men and 66% of women had a wasted conference that indicated a high risk of metabolic complications. In kids, 25% of kids are overweight or obese, and 41% of teenagers are overweight or obese. These are data published in the New England of Medicine, in the top medical journal. So there is a strong correlation between obesity and type 2 diabetes, very strong. You know, when you increase wasted conference, your risk of diabetes goes high, uh, and in this study, basically, they, they follow people with young who type 2 diabetes. So these were people who were, were, were 29 years old, they already had type 2 diabetes. After 11 years of type 2 diabetes, so when these people, they were 39, so still very young, 39 years old, 67% of them, they had hypertension, 55% diabetic nephropathy, so these people probably, they're gonna need dialysis or kidney transplantation, 52% uh, dyslipidemia, 32% diabetic neuropathy, and 50% initial diabetic retinopathy. So impossible, impossible with these type of numbers, you know, to make, you know, healthcare sustainable. And by the way, type 2 diabetes is not only preventable, is also curable because in the, this is a randomized clinical trial published in Lancet of Endocrinology. Uh, in, in this study, people that lost, with type 2 diabetes who lost more than 15 kilos by lifestyle, 86% they were in remission. No diabetes anymore. They were not taking medication. 86%. One, one year, 15, more than 15% weight loss. And another important concept is that, you know, many of the diseases, you know, we see in our hospital, many of the common cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, endometrial cancer, uh, coronary heart disease, heart failure, vascular disease, stroke, vascular dementia, fatty liver disease, uh, diabetic nephropathy, hypertensive nephropathy, and many other ones, they share a common metabolic substrate. And in green, you know, all these risk factors are basically shaping this common metabolic substrate, causing multiple coronary disease at once. So the idea is that, you know, if you are preventing by changing the lifestyle and therefore changing these metabolic molecular parameter, parameters, you're able to prevent multiple chronic disease at once. Therefore, you are not gonna overload the hospitals with terminal cancer or heart failure, stroke, you know, with all the consequences, frailty, coronary heart disease, uh, and many other diseases that, you know, in principle, they are <clears throat> preventable in both in primary and secondary prevention. So at the University of Sydney, where I di direct the, the Charles Perkins Center RPI clinic, you know, we are trying you know, to think about how we can address this uh, crisis of sustainability of healthcare 
uh, uh, and, uh, and so we are coming up you know, with different ideas. One is that you know, we are now launching uh, in the next few days a lifestyle medicine clinical service where basically every patient who is referred by a specialist, let's, let's say you know, now we are starting to collaborate with this, the, 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 the specialist of the lipid clinic. You have hypercholesterolemia, you're gonna take the medication for high cholesterol, but what about the insulin resistance? What about the oxidative stress? What about the inflammation? What about you know, uh, the high blood pressure, many other factors? So we are gonna enroll these people with high cholesterol into this lifestyle medicine clinical um, uh, service that has been approved by the uh, Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, uh, where you know, these people, they're gonna see a, a chef in residence. We have hired a dietitian and a chef in residence because a lot of my patients say, yes, but I ha have no idea how can I cook uh, lentils or, or whole grains or vegetables in a tasty and healthy way. So the idea is that you know, we're gonna teach them how to improve their diet, but you know, being tasty, not just, you know, because a lot of people, they say, I don't know how to, how to cook healthy. And then you know, we'll have an exercise physiologist who's gonna teach them how to rearrange the exercise so that you know, we can achieve some of the results I show you know, with exercise only. So the combination of, and eventually, you know, maybe a psychologist and a, a specialist in stress reduction. Basically, the idea is that you know, if you are enrolling in this in-person and online program, like tonight, you know, we're gonna offer basically the program in person, but you, know, you can also connect by, by stream you know, and follow you know, these, these uh, uh, um, workshops. You, know, you can improve your metabolic health and reduce multiple chronic diseases at once. And we are also developing an eat platform with an app so you know, that you, know, you can connect and you, know, you can, through you know, all these new wearables and sensors, now we have sensors where you, know, you can measure 24-hour glucose monitoring. There are other sensors that are coming on the market where you're gonna be able to measure branch and amino acids and other amino acids. So you can basically experiment on yourself and see if your exercise and diet changes are really modifying your metabolic health. Therefore, you can learn on yourself instead of as a group and, and, and basically improve your health and reduce the risk of developing many chronic diseases. Because to be honest, health is our major asset. It's, it's the most precious asset that you know, we have. And probably in the future, it's gonna be unsustainable. And so unless you take care of yourself, then unless you are super wealthy and you can afford very healthy, very expensive you know, healthcare, probably, probably it's gonna be very difficult for any government to sustain this pressure uh, as I, saw, I show you with the inter intergenerational report. There are some studies in Italy showing that you know, uh, uh, every one dollar invested in proven intervention for chronic non-communicable disease can generate a return of seven dollars by 2000. So that's the only way, you know, changing conversation from chronic disease to chronic health that is gonna make our system sustainable. And by the way, uh, aging doesn't start when you are 50, 60 years old aging start in utero, even before. You know, now we have data showing that what you do before procreation is changing the epigenome. So how basically your genes are read and transcribed. And therefore, if you, have, if you are smoking, drinking, you're, if you are overweight, if you have diabetes, you are changing for three generations the risk of your offspring to develop these diseases. So that's why it's important to start as soon as possible to change your life, not when you are 50, when you start to develop disease. But the good news is that at any age, you can change the trajectory of the accumulation of metabolic molecular damage. And finally, another important point is that we are, we are starting to, uh, with the chef and the exercise physiology, to, uh, um, um, to do some workshops in high schools in, in Sydney because we think you know, that health literacy is extremely important. I think you know, that you know, we need to teach this concept in primary school, secondary school, university. In medical school, probably we do, I do four hours of this concept in, in, in Sydney, but in US, in Italy, close to zero, okay? So you get a degree in medicine without knowing you know, this knowledge and without being able to teach this knowledge to your, to your patients. And therefore, if we really want to transform 
you know, our society, we need, you know, to teach, like we teach grammar and math and history and geography, you know, we need to teach this concept to our kids so that it becomes ingrained. Year after year, you're going to learn and you're going to basically make this concept, you know, your own second nature. And so we're going to move the Gaussian curve of diseases to the right and prevent a lot of chronic diseases and save a lot of money can be reinvested in productive activities. So more research is needed, you know, to develop biomarkers. And there is also an industry to develop because with all these science, you know, there is an industry that can be developed uh, with biomarkers, you know, with all these uh, multi-omics, genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, uh, 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 metagenomics, epigenetics, you know, we can develop a lot of biomarkers to measure if we can change the biological age, are we getting biologically younger <coughs> or older? Are we having the optimal caloric intake or not? You know, we have studied, you know, we are submitting now that some of the people on calorie restriction who were overdoing calorie restriction, the DNA methylation get worse. So they were aging faster based on the DNA methylation because th that amount of calorie restriction was excessive. So in 2023, we don't have biomarkers that can tell us if we are overdoing exercise, if we are overdoing calorie restriction or proton restriction or whatever. And this is a huge industry. It's considered to be a 4.5 trillion market that you know, can be developed just by using all this knowledge and combine it in, in, in a productive way. And uh, because, as I said, you know, we need to move away from the sick care reactive medicine to a preventative mechanism-based medicine for health opt optimization. Optimal health is an investable asset. We have to embrace technology to deliver customized individual health solution plans, use hearables, wearables, the internet of bodies to capture health and performance in real time, and using, again, all this knowledge, multi-omics, big data, AI in healthcare, and there is a potential to do a lot of important uh, 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 startup and economies that, you know, they're going to really uh, <coughs> improve our health and make our economies sustainable. So these are some of the... Uh, people that I've been collaborating with. This is the Charles Perkins Center where I'm working in Sydney. And uh, uh, if you are interested, you know, I'm, I'm, I have a YouTube channel where uh, when I have time, you know, if I see some interesting articles, I do some videos, you know, to inform people about, you know, the new science in a, in a, in a kind of easy way because I think, you know, one of our, you know, uh, roles as academics is to inform the, the public because you are paying our salaries, you know, as, as taxpayers. I think, you know, we should return some of this information. And uh, I also wrote some books uh, for lay people to try to simplify this very complex, you know, emerging science that is more than emerging, is, you know, now kind of solid data uh, where, you know, we are trying to understand how we can combine all these intervention to promote health and longevity. Thank you. Thank you, Lou, for an amazing, it's a tour de force. Um, look, um, I have been reliably informed that we have time for a few questions and we have some roving mics um, and I'm sure Lou would be very open to taking some of those questions. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to ask. Remember, the advice may be of a general nature and may, may not be MS, uh, MBS scheduled billing, so um, I don't think you'll be yeah, charged, absolutely. but it'll be of a general nature. So if there are any questions, feel free to put up your hand. We've got a question here in the front. Thank you. Uh, th thanks for the uh, presentation. That was very interesting. Um, one quick question. Um, you mentioned the benefits of a Mediterranean diet. Uh, now, I was brought up in the UK, and of course, in the UK, you have breakfast, a fairly light lunch, and then a big dinner. Whereas in um, further south in, in Europe, it's the other way around. They have the main meal in the middle of the day. Uh, any comments on the benefits or otherwise of that? Look, you know, there is a lot of science ongoing on the timing of when we eat food. In animals, the data are suggesting that, yes, timing is very important because if you follow the circadian rhythms, I think, you know, the data, you know, we can di discuss with Leone, you know, the data in humans are still 
not clear. From my point of view, timing can be important after you, have, you took care of everything else. You know, if you take off, you know, reduce your calorie intake, you know, to avoid the increase in waistline, you exercise because basically you are promoting insulin sensitivity, you are increasing your mitochondria who are helping you to burn calories, you are increasing your BDNF by exercise, you do some strength training you know, to keep your muscles to prevent sarcopenia. After you, you take care of high quality, high fiber, low saturated fatty acids, low, low salt, uh, uh, low processed oil, and stuff like that, then probably there is also room for improving the timing. What I disagree, but we can argue, and the data science is gonna tell us the truth, you know, because a lot of people now, they are doing studies, there are multiple studies on time sensitive feeding around the world, they're gonna then, you know, maybe they're gonna prove me wrong, but uh, I don't think, you know, eating uh, unhealthy diets in, in four hours in the morning and lunch is gonna solve the problems. But I may be proven wrong. Um, Andrew. Thank you. Um, thank you, Doctor. Um, a question from online has come in. Um, which exercise is most effective for health span, heavy weights, long distance, or high cardio, or does it not make any difference? Different type of exercise, they are acting on different pathways. Okay, so, you know, I didn't have time, you know, again, you know, in 50 minutes, and I think, you know, I, 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 I probably talk more than 50 minutes. Uh, uh, it is impossible, you know, to, again, you know, to explain everything. But, but again, you know, different type of exercise. So endurance exercise and uh, interval training, high-intensity high tr interval training, resistant exercise. Don't forget about flexibility and a good posture because a lot of people, as they get older, probably I think in the U.S., the most expensive part of healthcare is back pain and joint pain, you know, you know, leading to uh, knee replacement uh, is because of bad posture. You know, if, if you're not exercising, probably you, you start to, to, to be, you know, to have, you know, a bad posture, you know, and, you know, you have to overextend your neck, you're going to have problems with your neck. And as you get older, this is going to be a major problem because then you have, you have to take, you know, anti-inflammatory drugs uh, like ibuprofen that has problems for the, for the stomach but also for... for, for uh, for um, the bone marrow is, is a major factor, you know, in causing some issue with the bone marrow. So there are a lot of problems, you know, by taking chronic, uh, chronically these anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, and, and, and so different type of exercise have, have, have different effects. But exercise is not a substitute for a healthy diet. We have proven, even when I was working in the U.S., you know, we have been studying people who are master athletes. And they believe that, you know, because they were running 60, 80 miles per week, because, you know, they were preparing for some marathons, they were healthy because they were lean, because they were exercising. And then they were eating a lot of, you know, fast food and lots of uh, refined uh, soda. Uh, no, you know, uh, uh, exercise is not a substitute for a healthy diet. Indeed, you know, there is a study just published in the European Heart Journal where they were studying long-life lo long athletes compared to people sort of who were similar body weight, but they were eating healthy and with some exercise, the uh, number of atherosclerotic plaques in the uh, long-lived uh, uh, athletes were much higher, both in terms of quantity and numbers. So uh, again, exercise is important, but combined with a healthy diet and healthy lifestyle. Question. Uh, we've got one over here, and then we'll take the question over here. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, I think most of us knew what you were talking about, so I want to know what role you think government has in this issue, because we've got marketing, we've got advertising, and we've got all this other stuff and obviously what's available on the supermarket shelves doesn't match what you've talked about. Um, so how can we make a situation where us as the general public um, actually put the actions that you've talked about? 
Now, this is an extremely important question, as, as we discussed in today, you know, for example, as I said, you know, the lifespan, the average lifespan in certain parts of Sydney is 26 years shorter than, for example, in Mosmon or Paddington, you know, in the affluent areas. Uh, as I try to discuss at the end, I think, you know, that education is probably the most important because at the end of the story, if you are educated because you start from the elementary and you have one hour per week of these topics where you know you really learn, you know, basically what are the knowledge. And of course, the knowledge is not fixed. You know, we are not talking about, you know, fed, you know, uh, vegan or paleo. You know, we are talking about evolving science. And as science evolves, you know, you should be able to basically update the CV uh, but starting from elementary, one hour per week, where you teach theoretical and practical how to exercise properly, how to measure your exercise, how to measure you know, your exercise is done properly, how to cook healthy food, not only the theory, but also the practical. I think you know, eventually, you know, basically, this information is going to spread. And if you go to university and you do high, low school and you, you have a, a mandatory reinforcing teaching on these topics, the future journalists, the future politicians, the future teachers, the future economists, they're going to come out of university. And so slowly we are going to change because at the end of the story, the marketing is trying to sell us things. But we are deciding what is in the supermarket. Because if I don't buy a certain food, after two weeks, the food is not be sold anymore in, in the supermarket. And I think you know we also have to change the primary health care system. In my vision, you know, we should have, you know, GPs, like maybe 20, 30 GPs with, uh, in, 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 a, in a facility where you have a chef in residence, an exercise physiology, a psychologist, where as a doctor, I'm going to prescribe you not only the medication, but also going to prescribe, you know, you have to do, I don't know, certain session of a healthy diet, healthy exercise. By the way, if you, if you go to the New England this week on the, on, the, on the website of the New England, it's amazing. There is a video where basically in US they are saying th th there are these professors and they say one in 10 Americans have type 2 diabetes. One in three, they have prediabetes. This is an epidemic that the government cannot sustain. And so now the government in the US is investing I don't know how many billions of dollars to start this basically program where they're going to teach lifestyle medicine to these patients with type 2 diabetes or prediabetes because they know that if they don't do this kind of preventative uh, uh, interventions, it's going to be unsustainable. So even in US now they are starting. So New England General of Medicine, when I saw you know, this video, I said, oh, finally. Question here, and then I think we'll take the question here, if that's okay. So, can we get a microphone to the gentleman here with the mask? Did I answer to your question? Do you disagree? So that's ma that you made an interesting point. We're obsessed with looks. Uh, not health. I think that's that's something that we need to, to sort of look at um, as a society that we value the way we look and don't consider that exercises for our health, not for the way we look. Yeah, indeed. Um, I think we've got that question and a microphone over to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is related to exercise. Of course, that um, is a whole gamut of things that you touched upon, which is difficult to talk about, but. In your talk early on, you did seem to focus upon the importance of strength in the gluteal and, I presume, the core muscles. Yeah. Would you like to expand on that, please? Because the most metabolically active muscle to produce, basic, to, to, to manage glucose are basically the big muscle. So if you want to maintain glucose tolerance insulin sensitivity, you have basically to have you know these big muscles that are very activated with a lot of mitochondria and the only way to increase mitochondria number and activity you know we have lots of studies so we are burning calories with exercise because the mitochondria are these basically organelles within our cells that are basically 
transforming oxygen with uh, carbs and lipids into ATP, into energy. And we know that, you know, with exercise, you can increase by 20, 30 percent the number of mitochondria and the activity of the mitochondria. And therefore, exercise is extremely important to get these mitochondria strong, active, so that you can burn calories. By the way, if you are completely sedentary and you have a, a low VO2 max, the VO2 max is a way to measure your fitness. Basically, is how much oxygen you are consuming. If you are sedentary, you have a low VO2 max, and so therefore you are burning very little calories. After you, know, you exercise for a year, you are increasing your mitochondria. In the same, let's say, you know, when you are sedentary, you are burning 300 calories an hour. After you do this exercise and you increase the number of mitochondria, the activity, in the same hour, you're burning double the calories, okay? So it takes time for the body to adapt and build this mitochondria number and activity. And by doing different type of exercise, going back to the, the other question, so for example, if you do high training, intestinal training, you are recruiting more fibers. Because if you do always the same exercise, you are recruiting only a certain number of fibers in your muscle. But if you do high interval training, you are forcing your body to recruit more fibers, and therefore you are building mitochondria in other, in other fibers in the, of the muscle. If you do some resistant exercise, you're also recruiting more fibers, and you're building more fibers, and so you have more mitochondria. So, yeah. G'day, thanks. Uh, I did independent fasting for two years under the Adelaide University program and I did lose 26 kilograms. I didn't notice a significant de decrease in my health issues as far as blood pressure. Uh, I didn't have type 2 diabetes at that stage. I did lose weight. However, due to a stressful psychological situation that occurred, I actually put on weight. My blood pressure went up. I ended up with tw three times the medication and I developed type 2 diabetes. So that was a clear example to me that weight loss wasn't the only solution, that psychological aspects are far more significant. Uh, as a result, in order, because I've dealt with uh, weight lo um, being overweight all my life, I actually undertook a gastric bypass. As a result, I've now lost 42 kilograms. My blood pressure has significantly dropped and my type 2 diabetes is re reducing. So that's actually been the biggest effect. I don't feel hungry. I don't eat too much because I can't. And as a result, that's actually been what saved me to some degree. So there's a few different aspects there to what you talked about. I agree with everything you said. However, I think psychological aspects and other issues are actually important as well. You are perfectly right. And you know, I was in, in one slide, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, you know, we are totally underplaying the importance of society, the family, connection, the habits, you know, if you're born, you know, in an in a, in a Italian family or in a Chinese family or in Indian family, the type of food, you know, you are consuming as a baby is what you are used to, okay? And then it's very difficult, it's not impossible, it's very difficult to change your taste, you know, that you acquired as a, as, 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 as a, as a young ch child. And therefore, that's why, you know, we need, you know, to basically restructure our society. And in schools, we have to teach you know, these topics, including the importance of emotional health and what you can do you know, with different techniques you know, to promote you know, emotional health and well-being. So there is a philos philosophical approach to life that you know, we don't discuss in schools, because right now it's all math, tech, you know, to become, you know, an engineer, a mathematician, a doctor, but, you know, all these aspects of emotional health, you know, spiritual health, philosophical health, they are completely missing. And as you said, you know, then, you know, people, they are facing their problems of anxiety, depression, because, you know, in the past, you know, there were less anxiety and depression because, you know, the family were more united, more strong. There was, you know, this community that, you know, one of the hallmark of, centenarians in Okinawa, in South Italy, in Sardinia, is this very strong family connections that are very important when you have problems in life. And in life, you know, we have problems. If you have a strong family, a strong network of friends who are basically engaging in healthy activities, 
it's easier. You know, if you are, you know, back then, you know, a lot of people were smoking because it was normal to smoke. And so you, as a man, you know, everybody was smoking, you were smoking. Or now, basically, a lot of people, they are drinking because it's socially acceptable to drink. And so, you know, you drink because, you know, everybody's having a glass of wine, a beer, and, you know. So, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a cultural, social uh, aspect, you know, you know, we have to solve. It's not only, as you said, you know, body and health and exercise and diet, but there are, as you said, you know, a more profound way of approaching these issues. I think we have a question here, and I think we might have a couple online, and then one at the back, and then I'm sorry, we're going to have to wrap it up. I know that we could probably go on for an hour, but um, look, a question in the front. Thank you. Buona sera. Buona sera. Uh, my question, if you could comment, on what we consider modern society considers health being an over-reliance on supplements and vitamins, how we're pointing to this thing towards health being a supplemented health and the enormous industry that's being built on that? Look, you know, this is a very good question. And uh, vitamins are important when your doctor finds that you have a deficiency of vitamins. Then, you know, it has a real therapeutic effect. But the idea that, you know, by taking vitamins, then, you know, you are healthy or you're taking these supplements or these... Uh, CR mimetics, resveratrol, or uh, metformin, or NAD boosters. There is no scientific evidence whatsoever. When I was a medical student, there was, remember, you know, there was this idea that, you know, the antioxidant, vitamin C, vitamin E, beta-carotene, were important for prevention of cardiovascular disease, cancer, dementia. Then, you know, we did a huge randomized clinical trial published in New England, JAMA, Lancet, showing zero effect, and for beta-carotene in smokers, there was an increase in mortality. For vitamin E, there was a trend for the increase in cancer, a trend. So at the most, vitamins in healthy people is not a substitute of a healthy lifestyle, and in some cases, it may even cause problems. And for all these you know, molecules, you know, some people are suggesting are anti-aging, resveratrol, metformin, uh, and their boosters, all this stuff you, know, you hear on the socials, there is no scientific evidence. So as a doctor, as a scientist, unless you show me in a randomized clinical trial that this molecule has anti-aging or anti-cancer or whatever effects, I don't believe you. So where is the data? Show me the data. Thank you, Lou. I was going to say it also gives very, very costly urine. Yeah, well. exactly. So. <laughs> <laughs> on, top, on top of that, so, it's I a multi-billion <laughs> dollar industry. So we have a couple of questions from online uh, listeners. Yeah. It's probably the last question we have time for, just in the running. Um, uh, we have a nicotine tax, we have alcohol taxes, should we have a sugar tax? I don't believe that you know, taxes is a solution. If you, if you remember, you know, in, in, in what the, when there were the alcohol prohibitionism, you know, in, 20s, yeah. in the 20s, it didn't solve the problem. I don't think, you know, uh, 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 doing laws, you know, that are uh, blocking people to buy something or tax people uh, is going to solve the problem. I think education, providing people with the social infrastructure, the real infrastructure, you know, I was discussing this morning, you know, now in Adelaide, you know, you can bike without crossing roads, you know, uh, and, and, and therefore you are, you are creating the infrastructure for people to exercise safely. You are providing the infrastructure for kids, you know, to exercise. You are providing the infrastructure for learning how to cook healthy in, in primary health care, in schools. Uh, and then people, they decide to do something. What I would do, what I propose instead of is to do the country, instead of putting a tax, I will say, if you are healthy, if you stay healthy and, you know, we can measure some biomarkers, I'm going to give you a discount by 1% in your taxes. So I'm not enforcing you to do something, but I give you an incentive if you stay healthy. Then true. I think, you know, it's going to work because I can decide, you know, I don't care. Even if, as I said, everybody should care because... I was reading the other day, in Italy, we have a public health system like in Australia, okay? Universal healthcare system is free. 
it was started in 1978. Before 1978, basically, like in US, if you had a job, then you, know, you had access to this private health, insu pri private, uh, health insurance and you, you and your family could basically access to hospitals. But if you didn't have a job, basically, you were on your own. And as I said, if you look at the numbers, I don't think, for, I don't think you know, we can you know, pay for this very expensive healthcare system for a long time. I think you know, then you know, at one point, basically, there are going to be such a long queue of people waiting for procedures. Because if you have you know, this epidemic of obesity in kids, 25% of kids obese, 41% of teenagers, I show you the data in New England, basically, by, by 40 years of age, 55% they have diabetic nephropathy. Who is going to pay for the dialysis for all these people for 20, 30, 40 years? Who is going to pay for it? And then if you are rich, you're going to have your uh, dialysis machine in, in, in your house. Otherwise, they're going to say, sorry, maybe we are going to prioritize young individuals and maybe older people. We say, we don't have enough machines. We don't have enough nurses or personnel to, to do that. So again, I think you know, that maintaining our health is not only our right, but is a must because we need you know, to be supportive of our society and reduce healthcare costs so you know, you know, we can make you know, the system sustainable for everybody. We have a final question. Thank you. This is actually very short. Yes, hi. I would like to congratulate you on putting the emphasis on prevention. When is the curriculum of our medical uh, education for doctors going to include a higher level of nutritional information? And when, or oh when, are they going to become health promoters and not disease treaters? That's what we are trying to do at University of Sydney. That's what I'm teaching, and I'm trying, you know, to. Uh, have programs where you know medical students they can come and you know and in our clinic and you know do both uh, theoretical and practical learning on how to cook healthy, how to exercise, how to do all this stuff that are so important. So we are trying to do our best. Look, that brings us to a close this evening. Uh, look, can I just once again thank Lou for a, a, just a, I think a tour de force of a presentation. It look to be honest, I was sitting there quite uncomfortable, and. I think that's a sign of a fantastic presentation that actually compels me to think about the problem. Because only when you actually diagnose the problem can you then start to develop a solution. So I think that's what we've seen tonight. I think we've seen an opportunity for us to change the way in which we actually provide a different way of seeing our health as being our responsibility. But that does require education. And I think that's what we've learned tonight. We've been, I think, really well schooled by an outstanding professor. Um, and again, Lou, I want to thank you for coming down. It's been worth the wait, and I'm really grateful for your time. Um, just before we do close, um, and I hear a round of applause from you all to thank Lou, I just want to just uh, draw your attention to the fact that we do have some light refreshments out the back, and I'm hoping right now, I'm hoping right now, <laughs> that they are nutritionally sound. So Josie, <laughs> Josie, I hope you haven't let me down because that will be embarrassing. So oh, we've got sorry, some... So they're, out, so, <laughs> so they're outside the foyer just out as we leave. Um, again, I would like to also thank Josie Gray and the engagement team from the University of Adelaide for assisting in putting on this presentation. And I'd like to thank you all for attending this evening and for those people who are watching online. And once again, a big thanks to Lou for an outstanding presentation. So if you join me in thanking Lou for a fantastic presentation, I'd be most grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Please join us out there for some refreshments. Good afternoon.